which is the final day and the day of uh, resurrection, uh, we said that the reason why it's called Al-Akhirah is because it is the last day and there will be no day after that. It will be eternal. And the meaning of having faith, having Iman in the last day is everything that leads up to the last day from the signs of the hour, death, punishment of the grave, the bliss of the grave, and a questioning of the angels, and likewise the hisab, the accounting, the reckoning, and all the various other things which have come regarding uh, the qiyamah that enters into belief in the last day. We mentioned also maybe 15 or 20 or so names that we see in the Qur'an, which Allah Azawajal has used for that day, indicating the greatness of that day. We see that the scholars such as Al-Qurtubi again, he says, كُلُّ مَا عَظُمَ شَعْنِهِ عَظُمَ شَعْنُهُ تَعَدَّدَتْ صِفَاتُهُ That whenever a thing, its uh, greatness is, 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 you know, its affair is great, then its attributes increase. وَكَثُرَتْ أَسْمَاؤُهُ And its names increase. So, we see that Allah Azawajal is, is uh, Allahu Akbar is the greatest. From his names are those which he revealed to us. And amongst his names are those which have not been revealed to us. And so his names are so many that we are unable to uh, enumerate them all. And this shows the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His beautiful names and his lofty attributes. And so from that same angle, whenever something is named and described in so many different ways, with so many different labels, with so many different titles, with so many different descriptions, then that shows the actual greatness of that thing. Even as Al-Qurtubi mentions, amongst the Arabs, just the word or the words that you can use for a sword, because the sword was something that they greatly valued, Obviously, they, they make conquests and battles and, you know. They say that there is even 500 different words or labels for a sword in the Arabic language, indicating, indicating the greatness of that thing. So in the same way, when we mention all of these uh, names which we find specifically in uh, the, the Qur'an, then uh, this shows the, the, the tremendous or the greatness of this, of this day. From the importance of belief in the last day, first of all, it is one of the six pillars of Iman, which is mentioned in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, and tu'min billah wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulih wal yawmil akhir wa tu'minu bil qadar khayrihi wa sharrih. That you believe in Allah, his angels, his books, the messengers, and the last day, and you believe in al qadar, the good and it's bad. Also, we see that Allah Azawajal frequently in the Quran, indicating its importance, is that um, he ties the last day with Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, for example, لَيْسَ albir أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ albirra مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ it is not righteousness that you turn your faces to the east or to the west, but righteousness is the one who believes in Allah and the last day. Even the hypocrites, as we see at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, they say, nas, Among the people are those who say, Amanna billahi wal yawmil akhir, That we believe in Allah and the last day. So Allah chose to mention belief in Allah and the last day as two very important pillars of, of Iman, without which Iman cannot be present. And so the hypocrites are making a pretense of believing in Allah and the last day. And they're not, they're not believers therein. So frequently in the Quran we see connection between Iman in general and belief in Allah and the last day. A clear example of this is the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he said, مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ 
فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَسْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him speak good or remain silent. So he mentioned belief in Allah and tied the last day. And from the traits of a believer who genuinely believes in the last day, is that he will either speak good or he will just remain, remain silent. I mean, he will measure his words and he will measure the effect and the consequence of his speech. If there's khair to come out of it, he will speak. If not, then he will remain silent. وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيُكْرِمْ جَارَحِ And whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him honor his guest. وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَحِ And whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him honor his guest. So these are three qualities which are a sign of a believer having genuine belief in, in the last day. And it's been connected to belief in Allah, which is to speak good or to remain silent, to honor one's neighbor and to honor one's guest. We also see indicating the importance that in the Quran, Allah Azawajal, he describes the believers and praises those who believe in the Akhirah. And he dispraises those who disbelieve in the Akhirah. So for example, Allah Azawajal, he said, وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ They, meaning the believers, they have certainty in the hereafter. Whereas in contrast, he says about the people of disbelief, وَهُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ And they, meaning the people of disbelief, in the hereafter, they you know, they, 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 they disbelieve. And then from the fruits of believing in the last day, what are the fruits? The fruits that the people benefit from. First of all, to believe in the last day is ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah has commanded us to believe in Allah and his messengers and his books and his angels and from that is the last day. Secondly, it is ziyadatul iman as we said at the very beginning that the companions would come to each other and they would say, Ijlis bina nu'min sa'atan. Let us sit together and believe for an hour. And just as you increase your iman by increasing your knowledge of Allah and his names and his attributes and his wise actions, and the more you learn of that, the more you increase in iman and the more you increase in obedience, then similarly, the more you increase in knowledge of this day, of the Akhirah, and the realities of the Akhirah, of paradise and hellfire, and the various affairs with which we have been informed in the Akhbar, in the narrations, then a person increases his Iman with the tafasil, with the details. So that includes everything that we mentioned, the signs of the hour, the major and the minor signs of the hour, death itself, what happens in the grave, the barzakh, and the resurrection and all of the affairs that will happen, the major things, the hawd and the sirat and the, the, the mizan and so on and so forth, a person's iman is increased. Also, the hereafter is something that leads a person to fear and hope. This knowledge and this awareness of the hereafter, it drives fear and hope in a person just as Allah describes the people of Iman people of righteousness their sides forsake their beds the righteous people their sides forsake their beds and uh, they call upon their Lord out of fear and out of hope وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ and from that which we have provided them, they spend. Right? So this, these people, when they, as occurs in Surah uh, Sajda, when they remember death and the hereafter, it drives this fear and hope and it leads them to righteous deeds from which is to spend from that which Allah has given them. So from the fruits of belief in the Akhirah is that it stimulates and drives these feelings of fear and hope, which as you know, love, fear and hope, are from the you know, essential things 
which drive a person's iman and drive a person's uh, behavior. Also from the benefits is that we acquire knowledge by way of the uh, belief in the akhirah of Allah's fadl, his bounty and favor, and his adal, which is justice, and his hikmah, and his wisdom. Right? Allah's fadl is in the sense that Allah gave tawfiq to the people of belief and iman. He aided them because they wanted guidance, and he aided them from his bounty and favor. Right? So not only did he, so basically he sent, he created us, he gave us faculties of hearing and seeing and reflecting. Then he sent books and he sent messengers to give us guidance. If we stop at this point and that's all that Allah did, this then is his adal being established. Right? This is the adal of Allah. However, Allah aided and supported and helped and directed and assisted certain people to righteousness, to iman and to tawheed and to the sunnah. He did that by way of his fadl, his, you know, by way of his bounty and his favor, which he didn't need to do. And so this means that when we look at the hereafter and people enter into paradise, they enter paradise because of his fadl, because of his bounty and his favor to such people, even though he did not need to do so. Because his adal has already been established. Meaning, it was sufficient for Allah simply to create you, give you a fitrah by which you are inclined towards the truth already, then send you books, in fact, he gave you reason and hearing and seeing and reason, then he sent you books, then he sent you messages, and these messengers explain this is the right way, this is the, 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 the wrong way, this way it takes you to paradise, this way it takes you to hellfire. If that was all that Allah gave, then his adal, his justice has been established upon the whole of creation. No one can come and say, I was wronged, I didn't know, he didn't send guidance, no one can say that. So when we look at the akhirah and what happens therein, we see very clearly Allah's fadl and his adal and also his hikmah, his, his wisdom in his actions in the sense that he will reward whoever deserves reward and he will punish whoever deserves punishment. So everything in its proper place. And so Yom al Qiyamah, when we see, you know, the people of disbelief, the people of tyranny, the people of mass murder and slaughter, the people of, you know, whoever did evils, they will be recompensed with whatever is due to them. So all of that from the fruits of belief in the hereafter is uh, we appreciate the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over many of his creatures and the adal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over all of his creatures and the hikmah, the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his actions in establishing justice and rewarding everything without leaving or missing even an atom's weight of good or evil that needs to be recompensed. Also from the fruits of believing in the hereafter is it causes a believer to be completely balanced and moderate in his actions. Because all of the believer's actions are either in between that which requires shukr or that which requires sabr. Right? So either you have to be grateful for the bounties and favors of Allah or you have to be patient upon the hardships and difficulties that Allah brings to you. And so belief in the hereafter, when you believe in the hereafter, and you know these two things, then it brings uh, like this i'tidal, brings this balance and moderation in all of these uh, affairs. So when a ni'mah, a bounty comes to you, you do not basically get uh, deceived by it. And you, know, you don't get... Um, you don't uh, become uh, engrossed and deceived by the bounty. You take it in moderation. This is the favor of Allah. This is the bounty of Allah. This wealth or this, you know, whatever it might be. And you don't become deceived by it. Conversely, when it comes to trials and tribulations, like a musibah, like a calamity, then you are not, uh, you don't fall into despair from the calamity. Right? So everything that comes to you, you know it's either 
shukr, gratefulness to Allah, or it is sabr. And these things will be re recompensed on the day of judgment. And that's why we see that the affair of the believer, the messenger described this affair of the believer in the hadith in which he said, Ajaban li amri al mu'min. How amazing is the affair of the believer? Uh, and he says, Inna amrahu kullahu lahu khair. In all of his affairs, there is goodness for him. Walaysa dhalika li ahadin ghayr al mu'min. And this is not for anyone other than the believer, right? The believer with genuine iman, genuine iman in Allah, his books, his messengers, the last day. And so he says, in asabathu sarra, fakana shakar, fakana khairan lahu. If something pleasing comes to him, then he is grateful and that is better for him. Wa in asabathu darra, sabar, fakana khairan lahu. And if some hardship or some harm comes to him, he is patient and that is better for him. Right? So from the fruits of Iman in the Akhirah, in Qiyamah, in the, in, in, in the standing, in the resurrection, in the last day, is that a believer is led to be moderate and balanced in all of his affairs. And as the scholars mentioned, uh, that the mention of death, it causes a person to be somewhat disturbed and uncomfortable about this temporary abode. Just the thought of death and the hereafter makes you feel uncomfortable that I, I don't belong here. That this is not my abode. And uh, they mention that it then turns a person to face in the direction of the hereafter. Also, uh, a person in the life of this world, he is either in between a kind of calamity or hardship, or he's in abundance, or he's in abundance, or he's in a favor or a bounty, or he's in a trial. So depending on which of these two situations he's in, if he's in hardship, so you're going through a calamity, a hardship, a difficulty, then when you mention death, and you remember death and the hereafter, that calamity now becomes small. Because compared to the calamities after death in the grave and the hereafter, every other calamity you face in the life of this world of disease, of illness, of anxiety, of grief, of loss of wealth, of loss of limb, of loss of uh, whatever it might be, these things pale into insignificance. So if you are in, in a hardship and a calamity, then remembrance of death and the hereafter makes that to dissolve. And conversely, if you are in ease and in plenty and favor and enjoyment and, and lots of, of wealth and offspring and you know everything like that, then again the remembrance of death and the remembrance of the hereafter, then it makes you realize that you know you should not be deceived by the likes of these things and you should not be hindered from Allah's obedience by the likes of these things. So this shows that belief in the hereafter and firm conviction and also knowledge of the tafasil, as we said, the details of what will happen at death and following death and all the tafasil, the more details a person knows, the more vivid is the picture in his mind. And the more vivid is the picture in his mind, then the greater the effect upon the heart in driving that fear and that hope and all those other things that lead him to you know, use his reason and give preference to the hereafter over this life. Likewise from the fruits of the belief in the hereafter is that it inculcates certain great qualities. From those qualities, for example, is uh, generosity. It makes a person to be generous, uh, to you know, spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, it makes a person to be courageous, to have courage. Because if you know that once you are resurrected, then every evil that you did will not go missed, and every good that you did will not go missed, and you know that there will be true justice, as we said, and there will be tremendous reward, this now makes a person to be courageous in facing the challenges of this world, facing death with courage, facing illness with courage, Facing poverty with courage. 
facing anxiety and stress. Yes, we, go, we undergo anxiety and stress. We have these feelings. And these feelings are heavy on our minds and our shoulders. But when we remember the hereafter, these things, they become light and easy. And so we face them with courage. We face the events of life with courage. As opposed to the people of disbelief, as you know. The people of disbelief, they have no hope in the hereafter. They do not believe in the hereafter. And that's why we see among them the trivialest, or the, the, the most trivial of things which happens in their lives. They see that they will commit suicide or they will, you know, they will break down and have a nervous breakdown over something so trivial and so silly. You know, the dog died or the cat died or they lost the dog and can't find it again. They're now heartbroken, you know. Um, the most trivial of things because they have no iman in the hereafter and they are deceived by the life of this world. So the hereafter makes a person courageous to be brave in facing the challenges of this life. Also, it makes a person to be humble and to abandon this kibr, the arrogance because on the day of judgment, the mutakabbirin, the mutakabbirin, they will be the most insignificant of people on Yawmul Qiyamah. And so it also leads a person uh, to, be, to be humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are from the many, many benefits of uh, the Akhirah. And finally, the Qiyamah, Al Qiyamah, again, this is another name for the Akhirah, Al Qiyamah. Why is it called Yawmul Qiyamah? The scholars give uh, numerous reasons. First of all, it is because all the affairs that we mentioned of resurrection, hisab, the jaza, the reward, and all the things, they will be established on that day. So it's called Yawmul Qiyamah, when Qiyam will be made of these affairs. This is the view of some of the scholars. Some of the scholars say it's, it's called because the creation will be brought out from the graves and made to stand in front of their Lord. So therefore it's called Al Qiyamah, because of the Qiyam of the creation from their graves. Others say it is because people will be made to stand in front of the Lord of the worlds. And others say it is because Jibreel alayhi salam and the angels will stand you know, on, on that day in rows and in ranks as occurs at the an, end of Surat uh, an naba right? So these are some of the reasons why it's called Yawmul Qiyamah. And um, from the greatness of this day, is we see Allah himself in the Qur'an, أَلَا يَظُنُّ أُولَٰئِكَ أَنَّهُمْ مَبْعُوثُونَ لِيَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ Allah again described this as a mighty, as a mighty day. He also said in another verse, إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ يُحِبُّونَ الْعَاجِلَةِ وَيَذَرُونَ وَرَاءَهُمْ يَوْمًا ثَقِيلًا Indeed, those people, they love the present life, and they ignore and leave behind them, يَوْمًا ثَقِيلًا a very heavy, heavy and mighty day. And at the beginning of Surah Al-Hajj is a depiction of the terror and the awe on that day in which Allah Azawajal, he mentions Yawma Tarawnaha the day on which they will see this hour established. Tadhalu kullu murdi'atin amma arla'at Every uh, breastfeeding woman who is breastfeeding the child will abandon and forget what she is breastfeeding. And every woman pregnant will drop her load. You will see people as if they in a drunken stupor, but they are not. They are not drunk. It's like you see these people on, on the streets, you know, they... they out, drunk, and they don't know where they are going. This is how you will see people on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, in a drunken stupor, but they will not actually be drunk. They will not be intoxicated you know, uh, in that way. وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ شديد. However, the punishment of Allah is severe. So this is a, a depiction of the realities on that day. This is what you will see. The terror from that day, pregnant women will drop their load, women will leave their breastfed babies and people will be walking around in, in, as if in a drunken stupor. Also, all relationships will be cut off on that day 
وَتَقَطَّعَتْ بِهِمُ الْأَسْبَابِ As occurs in Surah Al-Baqarah, that all friendships and any kind of associations and relationships, all those asbab will be cut off completely. And the kuffar on that day, they will want to ransom themselves with even if it be an earth full of gold. This is the regret and the remorse that they will have and the way that they will try to escape the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَمَاتُوا وَهُمْ كُفَّارُ Indeed, those who believe, uh, those who disbelieve, and they die whilst they are disbelievers. فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمْ مِلْءُ الْأَرْضِ ذَهَبًا then not even an earth full of gold will be accepted from them. Even if he was to you know, ransom himself with all of that gold. For them is a tormenting uh, punishment. And they will not have any helpers or aiders. So this shows that the people of disbelief will try to escape by way of ransoming themselves, even if it be with an earth full of gold, which Allah will, will, will reject. Also that day is a long day. The day whose length thereof is 50,000 years. If you can imagine 50,000 years, it is very hard to imagine the time scale of 50,000 years, but this is how long that day will be. Also we see that Allah on that day will bring the sun close to the people, and the people will sweat in accordance with their deeds, as occurs in, in, in the hadith. So some will sweat to the ankles, some to their knees, some to the, to the waist, some to the, um, you know, to, the, to, the, to the shoulders, because of the fear and the, and the terror on that day. So in conclusion, when this is the case, then this is the time in which people will be most in need of the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we finish with the hadith in which the messenger of Allah <coughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he informed us that there will be seven sab'atun yadhilluhumullah fi dhillihi yawma la dhilla illa dhilla. There are seven whom Allah will shade with his shade on the day in which there is no shade except his shade. And from them he mentioned Al-Imam Al-Adil, which is the righteous, upright, just Imam, the leader who is just with his population, with his subjects, and he establishes justice. وَشَابٌ نَشَأَ فِي عِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ And a youth who is raised upon the worship of his Lord. And seeing that most of you, most of us, we, 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 you know, we are in our youth, we are, we are shabab, in the, prime or in the prime of youth, then this is the greatest thing that a youth can be raised upon. And this is what, what I advise the youngsters in the audience and who are listening, that the greatest uh, thing that you can have as a youth is to be nurtured upon obedience to Allah and you will see the fruits of that later in your life. Right? If you are raised fearing Allah, establishing your obligations, being righteous, obeying your parents, keeping away from all of, of the evils in society and you maintain your, uh, you maintain your chastity, and all the other noble, praiseworthy qualities, if you pass through your youth, the time when you start developing and turning into a man or a, or a woman, you know, when you start you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, and you pass by that early period when your hormone, hormones are basically you know, uh, turning you into a man or a woman and you, you uh, into, in this kind of uh, difficult stage, if you... Be patient upon Allah's worship in that time period. You will see the fruits of that in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Right, this is what I advise you with. Do not be deceived by all of these distractions 
and things which allure, you know, which, which are alluring. All of this is deception. It is, it is uh, temporary. It will dissolve. It, it will be nothing. It is a mirage. Do not be deceived by any of that, ya yeah, ikhwan. Especially living in this society. Keep your head down. Learn a profession. Go to the masjid. Keep righteous friends. Seek knowledge which is beneficial in the world or in the dunya. And in that, there is enough preoccupation away from things which, which distract and, and turn you away. Right? And keep away from things which are not beneficial. Don't waste your time in, in, you know, in games or computer games or whatever it might be. Because all of these are, are ways in which you are deliberately distracted while you are robbed and embezzled of your iman and of your wealth you know, through other ways. Right? So you've got no time to be engaged in frivolities and pastimes. There's enough for you to be doing and enough challenges to be, to be addressing living in a society like this. And so therefore here, وَشَابٌ نَشَأَ فِي إِبَادَةِ رَبِّهِ is from those people who will have the shade of Allah on the day of judgment. A youth who spends his formative years devoted to Allah's obedience, keeping himself away from from evils, temptations, sins, and which corrupt the mind, corrupt the intellect. They, they make you develop evil habits that will remain with you for possibly the rest of your life. They will find it very, very hard to get, get rid of. Why do that? Why do that? It's like taking poison. Poison that's going to uh, harm you and remain with you for a very long time. Why, why do that? Why disable your body like that? It doesn't make any sense. So in the same way, why poison your heart and your mind? So the way to do that is to be devoted to Allah's obedience and to, to be chaste, to be upright and spend your time you know, worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will see the fruits of that later in your life. Allah will give you plenty. Allah will remove calamities from you. Allah will give you a, a meaningful, wholesome, good life you know, by, his, by His permission. And then He said, وَرَجُلٌ مُعَلَّقٌ قَلْبُهُ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ a man whose heart is attached to the masajid. Right? He loves the masajid. He uh, is attached to the masajid. وَرَجُلَانِ تَحَابَا فِي اللَّهِ اِجْتَمَعَا عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَا عَلَيْهِ And two men who love each other for the sake of Allah, they meet together for the sake of Allah, and they separate each other from the sake of Allah. Now what does this mean? This means that your relationships with other people shouldn't be, it should be for the sake of Allah, right? It should be purely for Allah's pleasure, not because, you know, you, you have trade, or this one's going to benefit you in something, or that one's going to defend you in something, or that one's going to ally with you in an issue which you've got a dispute, or a person who is sincere doesn't look at these things in his allegiances, and his, he doesn't seek friendships for this reason. Right? The friendship is purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are a believer. You believe in Allah the last day. And you are upon the sunnah. You are upon tawheed. I love you for the sake of Allah. Let me spend an hour with you. Let me discuss something of benefit you know, in, in, uh, in, in the religion or in the world that will aid us in establishing Allah's obedience. So you meet and you leave on the basis of this type of, this type of interaction. So that's how your relationship should be. And the more this is your relationship, then you enter into this, you know, the shade. Two men who love each other for the sake of Allah, they meet and they depart upon that. وَرَجُلٌ طَلَبَتْهُمْ رَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْسَبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ And this is from the greatest of things. A man who is tempted by a woman, a woman of honorable standing of nobility and of beauty so she tries to seduce him and he says i fear allah he turns away and he says i fear allah and this is from the greatest signs of the fear of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in that moment of temptation where there's nobody he could do what he's being invited to do but the fear of allah overwhelms him and he turns away and he says, I fear Allah. This individual will have the shade of Allah on the day of judgment. And a man, وَرَجْلٌ تَصَدَّقَ أَخْفَى حَتَّى لَا تَعْلَمْ شِمَالُهُ مَا تُنْفِقُ يَمِينُهُ A man who spends in abundance 
and he keeps it you know hidden until his his left hand his left hand does not know what his right hand has spent meaning someone who is generous with his wealth and he he spends without even keeping a, a record or knowing what what he's given until his left hand doesn't know what his right hand is spent and finally the seventh one wa rajulun dhakara allah khaliyan fafadat aina a man who remembers allah whilst alone he's by himself he makes dhikr of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that dhikr leads tears to come to his eyes and so this is another because that because that is genuine because he's by himself he's not in front of people and he's remembering allah and so this is from from the signs of sincerity that it is genuine fear of allah and shedding tears out of the fear of allah then this also is someone who will receive the shade of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so with that we conclude our reminder today on al al, al- maut death and al ba'ath the resurrection and the akhirah and we ask allah to uh, grant us tawfiq uh, to benefit from what we have heard and to take that as an admonition walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in i think inshallah ta'ala our brother and sheikh abdul illa is going to give you another uh, reminder inshallah uh, in a few moments if we wait for him to to come just a few quick questions while we while we just one or two questions inshallah Uh, if a muslim died suddenly but didn't say la ilaha illallah would he still go to jannah yes of course yes of course if he died as a muslim obviously if he died by saying the kalima before he passed away that would be that would be a good sign uh, but it's it would not mean that you know he he would not enter paradise just because he did not say la ilaha illallah at the point of death so yes quick and short answer a muslim who dies suddenly doesn't have the chance to um, say la ilaha illallah he will enter paradise until even for example someone can become a martyr someone who dies for example he's walking and a building collapses upon him and he doesn't know and he dies instantly right this person he will enter into paradise even though he was not able at that moment in time to you know to say uh, la ilaha illallah so yes uh, this person will still enter paradise as long as he entered as long as he died upon uh, iman genuine belief in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just uh, one question 
quick question. Is Muhammad وسلم, still alive in this world? And the answer is no. Because as we mentioned the ayah, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ Indeed, you will die, and they also will die. So the Messenger of Allah, he underwent the death that everybody undergoes in the life of this world. So, uh, in that sense, he is not alive. However, he is alive with a life in the grave, with a life in the barzakh. And the life of the prophets and messengers is somewhat unique in that, obviously, their bodies are not uh, consumed by the earth. And so, the short and quick answer to that is, no, the Messenger of Allah is not alive in the sense of the life of this world. But he is alive in the, in, in the barzakh. Yeah. Yeah.